Throughout the ages, peril, calamity and suffering were a major risk just about anywhere on the map. However, something improved in the human condition. Enter democracy, the unprecedented distribution of powers, holding the whims of the mightiest few in greater check, at least to a degree beyond what the world had ever before seen. Yet, not only does democracy inherently contain several issues, especially when it comes to producing the most impartial and sustainable policies, it is also easy for the wealthiest few to influence what the majority will believe and desire, making democracy merely an asset to the greatest players, a tool to only the richest and most powerful people on earth, the monopolists of power and profits. Yes, democracy inherently ensures that only the most wealthy, those with the power to influence the most people, will have the greatest sway. Although democracy has the potential to place certain checks and balances on those who hold power, the way around those checks and balances is to centralize and monopolize, effectively making choice an illusion, a set of options that each ultimately only serve the same elitist class. While democracy is better than most other arrangements that were experienced through human history, it is incentivizing and enabling the largest concentration of power the world has ever known, and virtually every last region of the world is plundered by this elite class, effectively making slaves of most humans throughout the world. What if there were something a bit better than democracy? The will of the people can be shifted through media and propaganda. This has been the tool of nation-states for as long as they've been around. If you know that the nation-state is lying to everyone, but most of your peers believe what they've been told, you're able to notice the folly of democracy in that moment, as your peers vote according to the lies they are told. There can be emotionally charged trends and movements that stir enough people to affect policies, and these can impose a subtraction on lives in surprising ways, from raising the cost of living to making entire cities practically uninhabitable. The policies were not checked for impartiality or sustainability, so the consequences of those policies can expose some alarming inadequacies of the beloved democracy. As a republic, the United States has elements of democracy, as all republics do, given practices like voting, petitioning and protesting. Constituents writing into their senators, members of Congress, legislatures, governors and presidents, anyone can feel like they are heard, which is comforting to believe, until you understand that foundational rights can be taken from you through exactly these democratic means, and media is regularly implying that the existence of rights is the gateway to every imaginable danger. The truth is that individual rights get in the way of collectives and individuals who wish to control everyone else. It's true that the founders of the United States set us up with a strong prioritization of inalienable rights, but also true that they hindered that aim with the low-tech arrangement known as the nation-state, the republic that many were proud to be a part of, at least till they realized it's a corporation controlled by the ultra-wealthy. The founders simply had too few tools in their time to set up for the degree of impartial and sustainable peace and freedom that they were passionate about. That kind of lasting and solid structure for maintaining peace and freedom would not be possible for them to fully conceptualize in their time, even given the enlightenments of their era, the wealth of philosophical contributions they could draw from. There were some important components missing, but, thankfully, today we can see clearly what was not possible for them to see then. Today, we can see that the will of the people is flawed, kind of how a random person on the street could share their preferences, which would likely have several fallacies and inconsistencies at its basis. In other words, whether it's a decision by a group or an individual, it's still coming from human judgment, human intuitions, and human tendencies, which, as we know, are often producing consequences that we have to endure and correct later on. So, let's examine what's better than human judgment. Enter universalitarianism. You've heard of vegetarianism, the belief in or practice of prioritizing vegetation as a food source, and you've heard of humanitarianism, the belief in or practice of prioritizing human well-being. So this belief in or practice of prioritizing universality becomes a concept we can now be ready for, as we get more familiar with these suffixes, tarian, meaning the prioritization, and ism, the belief or practice. So then, now all we have to do is make sure we know what universality means. Suppose someone wants to install a pool or a hot tub in their backyard, and it will be placed above ground. However, the ground is uneven at the chosen site for placement, which could stress the materials holding the water and put the whole thing in a tilted position. The remedy is to level the ground, using the proper sediment and even cement, depending on the permanence desired. Notice that the entire area must be level, not just part of it. If the above ground pool is a rectangle, the entire rectangle must be level, not just some of it. Universally, the entire site has been leveled, so there are no uneven areas, and the pool can be installed. 
Imagine a car company that goes through enormous lengths to engineer luxury, style and presentation, but then only has a skeleton crew working to ensure the mechanical excellence. Imagine that hundreds of brilliant minds are working on the look of the car, and only a couple of people with meager budgets are working on developing the mechanical longevity and reliability. That would be a very skewed application of high standards, which means that it is not a universal application. It's uneven. It favors a particular focus and neglects the rest. Universality is the impartial application, universally. Universally, whoever you are, wherever you are, what should the law be? Should certain people have immunity? Universality says no. Should certain people get to rule the rest? Universality says that, if you get to rule me, I get to rule you, which cancels out both. Universality says that, if you get to tax me, I get to tax you, which cancels out both. In other words, nobody gets to rule, and nobody gets to tax, or do anything else that any other person couldn't do. Universality insists that nobody is special, and nobody has a higher place of authority than anyone has, which is simply to say that our authority universally is limited to preservation of our rationally deduced inalienable rights, the authority to prevent others from violating either ourselves or others. Universality is impartial, and it will produce only solid, sustainable civilizations, with policies that can only maintain a level playing field, unlike democracy, which maintains the rigged game that keeps most people enslaved below their greater potential. Universality cannot be used by propagandists and media monopolizing elites to maintain the rigged game. In fact, there is only one possible standard that can unrig this rigged game, and it's universality. Utilitarianism is the practice of prioritizing that which is supposedly for the well-being of the majority, and it's full of problems, which can be summarized by the 20th century mass fatalities at the hands of powerful men claiming their actions are for the greater good. It emboldens collectivist agendas that dehumanize individuals and carry out agendas for overbearing, megalomaniacal leaders seeking to fulfill their utopian fantasies on the backs of disposable individuals. Totalitarianism is another word with the same suffixes, the practice of prioritizing total control, so that all are in total control of the nation-state, often justified by using an appeal to utilitarianism. Contrast this with libertarianism, another word with the same suffixes, the practice of prioritizing freedom. Notice that freedom cannot be sustained if it cannot unrig the rigged game, and notice that libertarianism is not the correct path to freedom at all and that only universalitarianism is the correct path to both peace and freedom, and add to that the equality of opportunity, or the unrigged pursuit of prosperity and flourishing. In the process of reviewing some of these words, you have been able to see that, although universalitarianism is not yet in a dictionary, it contains an important concept, one that was just beyond the many other concepts of enlightenment that the founders were already juggling. To be fair, the steps can only be so big at a time. We find this important concept of universalitarianism in the deepest core of rationalism, the most important tool we have for getting to know our reality. If something is a constant truth, such as an operating principle or law that makes possible the seen and unseen physics of our reality, it is true universally, regardless of time or place, regardless of who you are, who you know, whether you're considered to have a royal bloodline, or otherwise. In fact, universalitarianism just means the game is not rigged, that nobody is special. And if you happen to be smart and rich and competent, that is great and all, but it is certainly not a basis to be controlling or ruling anyone. So, does universalitarianism support the practice of having nations? No. Does it support the practice of having presidents and governors? No. So, is it just anarchy? No. The system of law that can be deduced from universality is varaki, which simply means rule by truth, and, as we've briefly covered, if there is a constant truth, it is true universally, making universality a vital asset to rationalism, the means for finding truth. Varaki is necessarily hierarchically flat, necessarily open, decentralized, demonopolized, transparent, impartial and competing, a system of decentralized law that is borderless, taxless, rulerless, yet has an open, global congress of people who collaborate using the rational method to implement universalitarianism in the diverse aspects of law, and ensuring impartiality in all writing and enforcement of laws. So, can Varaki and its universalitarianism break the world free from this rigged game? Certainly democracy cannot, and certainly nationalism is part of the problem. Certainly the founders meant well, but they could only work with so much at a time. Certainly we do not need representatives in the age of internet. 
Certainly taxes were started long before we could instantly pay any number of ways, of our own free will, as a trade or donation. Certainly we have not reached the optimal legal system.